days, uh, we had some good announcement at the UN General Assembly. The reality is we are not there yet. And that's why mm. over the coming weeks we need particularly the biggest economies, the G20, to step forward with more ambition. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alok. And uh, that resonates very much uh, with us at the IMF. We actually are so much engaged now to integrate climate considerations in our own work. Why? Because it matters for growth and prosperity over time. And when countries are hit by a climate shock, it matters to people and their economies right now. We take climate as a defining factor in the way we approach our policy engagement with countries, the way we think about building capacity in finance authorities, the way we think about macroeconomic data and how we can be a factor in what you're talking about, a massive transformation of our economies to low carbon and climate resilient future. Very uh, often people ask me, why would climate be of any relevance to the International Monetary Fund? And the answer is very simple, because how we address climate change matters in reducing risks to people and economies, but it also matters because it creates opportunities for green growth and green jobs. In other words, it is at the heart of the work of the IMF, which is about growth, employment, and financial and macroeconomic stability. Uh, I'm very interested to hear from you as COP president, when you discuss climate change with leaders from a very wide range of countries, especially from developing countries vulnerable uh, to climate shocks, coastal communities, what messages do you hear from those leaders that are relevant for us at the IMF, that are relevant for how economic policy is being uh, structured and positioned for the future? Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I think, Christina, that was a, a great explanation of, of why climate matters in the work of the IMF. I think there are lots of people out there, uh, you know, who think uh, of the IMF as uh, being focused on issues like inflation, uh, 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 like public debt. Uh, and so I think it's great that, uh, uh, you know, you have this focus and uh, a really great explanation as to why it's so important for the IMF that uh, climate action is something that takes place. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, the, the messages I'm getting from uh, developing countries, uh, the climate vulnerable countries, is that you know, the world has to recognize that they are on the front line of uh, uh, climate change. And actually, uh, you know, these are countries that weren't uh, ultimately uh, responsible for creating the climate change that they are facing themselves. And um, they have two big asks. Uh, one is uh, the ask from uh, all countries, but particularly the biggest emitters, the G20 nations, to step forward with ambition mm -hmm. to cut uh, emissions. And the second is the issue on finance. And um, I mean, one of the things that I, I certainly feel very much is that uh, you know, climate change is, uh, I believe, the biggest security risk that the mm -hmm. world faces. And you see this very acutely around the world. So whether it is uh, an issue of uh, scarcity of water, uh, whether it is mm -hmm. issue of uh, uh, food and the impact of, uh, uh, of droughts, of, uh, of, of locusts, for instance, in parts of Africa, uh, whether it's an issue of uh, forced migration, uh, or indeed health impacts. I, I do think there are lots of countries that believe that uh, you know, this mm -hmm. is the number one issue that we need to address. So I think in terms of the, the issue on finance, of course, delivering on this uh, 100 billion mm -hmm. is, is absolutely critical. And um, you know, I've been working very hard on that issue over the past months. Uh, we're, we're going to be setting out a delivery plan ahead of COP26, working with uh, our friends in the German and Canadian government. And you know, we've had some good news. Mm. Uh, the, uh, uh, the US President Biden put forward uh, a doubling of their climate finance commitment at the UN General Assembly. We've had more money this year uh, put forward by Japan, by Canada, uh, mm. by Germany, which is all great news. But actually, we need all of the developed nations to step up and support this particular effort. 
And when it comes to finance, I think the, the other issue that uh, developing countries raise is about access to finance. So what they will say is that, yes, uh, you know, big numbers are, are, are put out there, but actually their concern is getting access to the finance. And so, uh, you know, you and your team very kindly joined us at the um, Climate and Development Ministerial meeting we held back in March. And the result of that is a task force the UK has set up together with Fiji. And we're going to pilot in five countries uh, some projects to ensure that uh, we can see how we can get better access to finance. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you know, the final issue is, obviously, developing countries want to see more finance going to adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say two big asks. One is on finance, and the other is on, on mitigation. And that means the G20, mm -hmm. all of them, stepping up with mm -hmm. plans to cut emissions ahead of COP26. Uh, thank you. And that actually uh, is very uh, important input for us at the IMF. On the uh, first issue of access to finance, uh, as, uh, as you know, our membership has decided to put forward the largest allocation of special drawing rights, $650 billion equivalent, to help countries underpin the recovery from the uh, pandemic-induced crisis. But as we do so, the membership is also uh, ready to experiment with on lending some of the uh, SDRs from countries with strong positions that don't really need it for their reserves to go to countries that are in desperate need of financing so they can cope with the uh, pandemic, but also underpin this transformation to low carbon and climate resilient future. And I'm very pleased that during the annual meetings this year, we will be discussing the creation of a new resilience and sustainability trust to be funded by on lending of SDRs exactly for that objective, to allow countries to change their economies to low carbon performance, and especially for vulnerable countries to build resilience to climate shocks in the future. Uh, on the issue of financing, we are also helping countries to be more explicit about their integration of climate indicators in macroeconomic indicators. We have a big initiative on data. So investors can see how their climate plans translate into the right policies. And in that regard, we are emphasizing on four actions. One, pricing carbon. Unless we price carbon and move that price up from $3 a ton where it is today to around $75 a ton by 2030, we are not signaling to businesses and to consumers that a low carbon future is a must. Second, to get more fiscal space and more investment in this green transformation in low carbon, climate resilient uh, infrastructure, urban development, you talked about water, water management. Uh, so we can give an impulse for the transformation uh, through this action. Three, to be sure that we recognize there are vulnerable communities and of course vulnerable countries, they need help for this transition. And that has to be done in a way that is fair and four, and that is the point you make, prioritize adaptation in countries that contribute very little to climate change, but suffer tremendously its consequences. So we embrace all this in our so-called Article 4, in our uh, policy engagements with countries, in our capacity development, and very important in our financial sector work where we help these risks to shocks, to transition, to be explicitly visible for investors and on that basis shift the direction of investment to where it has to go. Uh, I was, uh, uh, Alok, I was very impressed uh, to see that uh, uh, climate related investments are going up and up and up. They jumped by 50% over the last year but they're still tiny 
overall, you know, they're like one quarter of 1% of the total investment flows today. That has to change. And we want to send the signals for this change to happen. And actually, that takes me straight to my next uh, question to you. If you were to get your wish come true in the participation of international institutions like the IMF, like the multilateral development banks at COP26, what do you want from us? What are our marching orders? Well, uh, firstly, I want to thank you, Priscilla, because you, you have been a, um, a, a real sort of climate champion and driving the, the SDR issues. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's great that uh, the discussion on, on, on reallocation and looking at different trust funds is going to take place at your annual meeting. And I hope there will be conclusions on that because uh, there are developing nations that uh, talk about, you know, how little was reallocated last time there, was, uh, there were SDRs issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, G7 of course, set out uh, some months ago their thoughts on uh, uh, the fact that you know, there needs to be a good portion of reallocation coming out of the $650 uh, billion. So, uh, and, and you're absolutely right. I think that the countries will, uh, the developing nations and the vulnerable countries will want to see this reallocation coming and supporting them with a, uh, you know, a, a green recovery. Uh, that's something that uh, we all have an opportunity to do now coming out of COVID. And I think this is that but one of those sort of uh, key moments, I think, in history where you can reimagine how your economy looks. Uh, and uh, of course, to do that, countries need financial support. So I'm really grateful for all the work that you have been doing, you and your team, in driving this forward so resolutely. And uh, as I said, uh, I hope uh, uh, at your meeting you will reach some, some conclusions on this as well. Uh, in terms of the MDBs, uh, look, I mean, from my perspective, um, you know, the work that you are doing, uh, the World Bank more widely, the other MDBs are doing, is absolutely critical. I mean, it really is very, very critical. And uh, I talked about the 100 billion, obviously, uh, the, uh, the finance that's uh, allocated from the multilateral development banks uh, will count that. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, you know, seeing that actually we, are, we, are, we have got uh, MDBs uh, increasing mm. the proportion of their funding which is being allocated mm. to um, climate projects, I think is, is very good news. Obviously, we've been seeing that uh, at the World Bank uh, as well, to see that increased financial commitment. And of course, we need to see uh, more of it. Um, and I think there's a very important point you've raised about that balance mm -hmm. between adaptation and mitigation. And one of the things that developing countries will mm -hmm. tell you is that for a very long time, uh, adaptation has been seen as the poor cousin of mitigation. And uh, they want that to change. And I think you, know, you very clearly uh, understand that call as do I. So I think what we want to see is uh, more funding being allocated to uh, adaptation. Uh, and then you know, the good news is that I think just about every MDB is now committed to align its financing with the, with the Paris Agreement uh, by, by 2025 or indeed earlier. And you've got people like the EIB who are already there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is uh, what I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, more commitments when it comes to the finance which is playing to climate action. I'm looking for uh, uh, more focus on adaptation. Uh, and thirdly, uh, you know, where, where MDBs are able to, to accelerate their, uh, their commitment to align financing with the, the, the Paris Agreement. And um, I, I think it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that one of the other things that MDBs do, of course, is to leverage in private sector uh, money as well. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a critical part of that 100 billion, uh, you know, the public money, but also the mobilization that comes in from the private sector. So, uh, you know, where MDBs are able to do more of this, uh, you know, I very much uh, welcome that. So uh, absolutely, as part of the financial architecture, MDBs uh, have a critical, critical role to play. Uh, and uh, there's also an opportunity, of course, to think about, you know, potential new products. Uh, which may assist in getting more private sector money in, which may help uh, in the energy transition. Uh, you know, we are seeing uh, lots of very good announcements that have come from countries on ending international coal financing. Uh, but you know, how do you how do we ensure that uh, uh, you know coal assets that are already out there and operating can perhaps be retired um, earlier? Uh, that can perhaps uh, be retired in a way that aligns with a, a net zero world by the middle of the century. I think all of this is in play and i know uh you know many of the mdbs are looking at these issues so uh, i'm looking forward to seeing what uh, the mdbs collectively have to say at cop 
uh, as well, because I know there's going to be good representation from them. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot. Now we have our marching orders for us at the fund. I take it to mean impetus for a green recovery, specificity on how our policy engagement will contribute to that. Uh, and I can tell you our objective is uh, to engage on mitigation with the 20 largest emitters. Very pleased to say that we have already done it with the UK and a number of other countries, uh, but also be very mindful of vulnerable countries. Give them your best policy advice on how they can adapt to what is going to be a rocky future for them. And on the financial side, I also got it to, to mean that uh, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust sounds great. Make it happen. Uh, and Absolutely. then last but not least, work with the uh, uh, multilateral development banks so we together can amplify the power of our policy engagement and the impact of financing we uh, provide. Thank you. Very clear, very useful. And uh, uh, yes, we will do. Uh, and I'm actually... Uh, uh, going to ask you something that I'm sure you ask yourself three weeks away. What is the reason for you to be hopeful this will be an impactful COP? And what makes you lose sleep? What keeps you awake at night? What are the big well, challenges still in front of well, you? Firstly, can I say uh, thank you for... Uh, in a brilliant summary, saying what I'm looking for is to, for, for the MDBs and the IMF to make it happen. That is precisely what we need before COP uh, to get the, the, the funding across the line. And of course, to also try and uh, you know, address some of these issues on um, uh, debt sustainability and, and, and fiscal space as well. But uh, I mean, uh, you know, you've asked me the, the, the question three weeks ago, um, what is keeping me awake at night? The one thing I can tell you, Christina, is that um, you know, there's been a limited amount of sleep over the past year. I'm uh, operating uh, at uh, 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 fairly low hours of, of sleep. And that's because this is so important that um, we collectively deliver at COP26 for the, for the world. Uh, what makes me hopeful is that, I mean, you know, I, I started in, um, in my finance career about 30 years ago. And um, uh, frankly, I mean, I, some of the, your, uh, your colleagues will be aware that there was a there was a guy called Swampy, that was his nickname, and he was kind of the face of climate action in the uh, 1990s in the UK. Uh, and uh, Swampy was someone who sort of occupied tunnels and sort of went up trees uh, to stop development. Um, now, 30 years on, I would argue that the Swampies are in the boardroom. So I have been uh, really very pleased by the fact that I think over the last few years, we are at that inflection point. In fact, we've gone past that inflection point where uh, the corporate world, the financial services sector, mm -hmm. is effectively singing from the same hymn sheet as governments and as civil society. They understand the challenge that we are facing in terms of uh, climate change and why we need to take action on it. And I've been really pleased by the fact that uh, we've, we've had this Race to Zero campaign, the UN campaign running, where uh, companies and, and non-state actors commit to go to net zero by 2050 on science-based targets, so not just some sort of vague, mm. vague promise. We've got thousands of, of big companies, uh, you know, multinationals uh, who have signed up to this. We've got um, mm. a, a grouping called uh, the, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which uh, our friend Mark Carney has been, been working on, for around $90 trillion of assets uh, committed to uh, go to net zero by 2050. Uh, and, uh, you know, the price of, of renewables is uh, plummeting. We've seen over the last 10 years that the price of, uh, of solar is down by around 80 90%. The price of, of uh, wind power, uh, 60 70%. And all of this mm. gives me a great deal of hope. I am absolutely certain that we will see a transition to a green economy across the world uh, in my lifetime. I'm absolutely convinced. The issue, though, is can we go fast enough so that we mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And that, Christina, is what we collectively need to uh, agree on at mm. COP26. And I would just end with, um, with one fact, because this is a decisive decade for the climate. 
-hmm. And for a child that is born today, mm -hmm. before that child reaches primary school age, effectively the future of this planet will be set. And that's why the world needs to come together at COP26 mm. and seek success so that we can tackle climate change and say to future generations mm. that we played our part when we were demanded to do so. Mm. Uh, you, you put it very well. Uh, yes, this is what gives us hope, that the tide is turning. People want this change. 70% of citizens around the world in the recent survey said, we are deeply concerned about the risks a changing climate presents to us and to our children. 80%, and this is the more, more important uh, uh, number, said we are prepared to make changes in the way we live so we can tackle this problem. The finance community is embracing sustainability and this transition to low carbon climate resilient economy. The IMF is right there putting climate at the heart of our work. And the only question for us is, are we going to do it fast enough? Because the change needs to happen now, this year, next year, the year after. This is the critical decade and we have the right person to lead us in this decade, Mr. Alok Sharma. Unfortunately, we run out of time, uh, Alok. Uh, I hope we can get together after the COP and then take stock. Is what you hoped for now a reality? And are we moving towards a future in which we all have done our part in the fight against climate change? Uh, we are in this together, Alok. It has been a pleasure to discuss these issues uh, with you. And uh, uh, may your every wish materialize at COP26. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank, thank you, you for all your support. And I look forward to seeing you in Glasgow. Yes, we will be there. Thank you. Best of luck. <laughs>